you know, I believe all of you are techie, so you know, who am I? So basically, I'm an electronics developer. I think around with uh, firmware and hardware, basically. Uh, for both uh, professionally, I, I do it for work and also for my own curiosity. So particularly, uh, I do embedded software and hardware consulting. And then uh, I'm also an open source uh, contributor to various projects. But uh, recent years, I've concentrated all my work on Zebra Atos. So that's the area I'm, I'm focusing on uh, working and also open, open source uh, work. So just before I go into the talk, how many of you know what is RTOS, real-time operating system? So quite a number of you, so okay, cool. How many of you know Zephyr RTOS particularly? So I just see two hands, So which is good. Uh, I can just give a very uh, quick uh, brief of what uh, Zephyr RTOS is about. So Zephyr RTOS is a real-time operating system, just like any other RTOS, but it has uh, added some uh, new features. It's kind of like a leading, uh, leading edge, uh, new RTOS, uh, open source in nature. And uh, these are the areas I think every one of us will agree uh, where real-time operating system will go on. Like you can see industrial IoT and asset tracking, all this area. And uh, I think we, we have gone through the era that, uh, you know, uh, between us, uh, if you talk about uh, many years ago, people will be talking about, oh, RTOS or bare metal, RTOS or bare metal. Like, uh, you know, some people will be arguing, oh, I will do bare metal. But I think today, many of us agree that any embedded system uh, mostly will be running some form of RTOS, regardless of what, uh, whatever application it is. So that's why I set a definition. So, so where Zephyr RTOS uh, lies, basically. So Zephyr RTOS is basically, uh, they have two, uh, few points, the uh, main points that they, uh, they target. One is it has to be small, so that it can run on any target. You know, anything with less than 8 KB flash, 5 KB, uh, 5 KB RAM, should able to run Zephyr on a very uh, minimum, at least a minimum. And then, yet, you have you want to be more powerful. You just don't want to offer only just uh, like other uh, RTOS, just a scheduler and so on. It's very boring or, you know, it's very common. So you have to be scalable. You know, you want to handle SMP, multi-processor handling and all these things. So that's another area. And then uh, you also want to be flexible. The kernel, you know, basically the kernel supports uh, uh, more than 450 volts multiple architectures and so forth. And uh, I think a uh, big area that we talk about RTOS and IoT, you want to go to the internet. So if you want to go to the internet, you want to make sure your code is uh, you know, at least secure in nature. It has some you know, vulnerability check and open source in nature, I think. So, so these are the area basically is at the So on a high level, uh, if you look on the right, you will see uh, on the box what Zephyr offers on out of box. It offers a third party library all the way until the hull so that you know you can integrate uh, vendor hull uh, into your, your Zephyr and you know able to use uh, Zephyr naturally. And uh, where Zephyr particularly uh, 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 fits or you know it's a unique uh, proposition is that wherever Linux doesn't fit, basically you know Linux might not fit on an MCU because Linux is big. But Zephyr can fit in there, and it works. Uh, it uses a lot of uh, philosophy or st uh, strategy being used in Linux into Zephyr. So that's why I think uh, people, you know, started to get interest and you know started to work on. And uh, it, it is highly portable and secure, like what we talked uh, before. Just like Linux, right? You can take a Linux kernel, run on an ARM. You can run on a RISC pipe and all sort of things, like different boards are supported. The same things are uh, are here. Particularly, if you are, you know, if you've been working on Linux kernel, you know, there's something called device tree, a config to do all these magics behind it. So that's what uh, being happened in uh, uh, what we call a uh, MCU world itself. So uh, I think uh, I'll just give a very brief introduction what uh, Zephyr is all about. Uh, now, particularly, and uh, about this uh, topic is uh, why Zephyr and RISC-V. What Zephyr uh, uniquely offer for RISC-V for how the support is like and so forth. So the first point is uh, both are open source in nature. Anybody that's supporting RISC-V, I think uh, inherently in their mind is like they want to be open source. Like, you know, the silicon is already open source. Uh, whatever things the ISA is open source, and you know you don't want to run a closed source uh, software on a open source uh, silicon or you know ISA basically. 
So that's I think a good combo. And then uh, the current state of uh, FRS in, in Zephyr is that uh, all common ISA that the RISC-V uh, supports is already there. So I think that the standard thing is uh, I want, if you look at the privilege set, there's this RV, RVM32 IMAC, the basic instruction set is fully uh, supported. And there are also some you know, uh, advanced extensions are already supported also. So basically you can say uh, pretty good, uh, uh, at least ISA level support architecturally is quite good. And uh, 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 you may ask uh, what about uh, some other standards that RISC-V already uh, set like we have uh, PILIC, uh, the interrupt controller for the uh, process basically. So that is, uh, a PILIC is a standard uh, interrupt controller uh, by the uh, RISC-V foundation and that is also supported, there's a driver already basically. And uh, also for machine timer, so all your ticks in uh, RISC-V you handle it uh, using something called c -Link. So c also the driver is supported. And uh, the fourth point is because of RISC-V is so modular and all are like uh, modular in nature, you want your software to be modular also. So that's where I lay down the point, uh, you know, Zephyr is structured and modular. So it's, uh, you know, very nice uh, fit. So, so this is a board, uh, I did uh, some coating, uh, basically the boards that we're going to be hands on. So I just want to give you an idea, you know, what uh, really been happening uh, behind the scene at a high level. So basically, you know, we say that uh, this is a SOC, uh, this 532 uh, Affinix Sapphire, and we are just enabling all the instruction that it supports, so that the, you know, ISA level knows what are the instructions are supported, and the entire kernel, or basically the Zephyr ecosystem, knows what are the ISAs being supported, based on the SOC. So you can see, I'm just telling, RISC-5 ISA, IEMA, uh, this, this process supports. So, and then when I do that, because Zephyr is so modular in nature and the build system is inbuilt, CNAKE can start the reading on this configuration file. So it started going, okay, uh, if I say uh, external A is supported, when you do a build, pass this A, uh, A flag to the compiler basically. So you don't have to configure all this thing, you know, it's all automated uh, in nature. And then uh, one more, just for another uh, uh, example, like any of you know k-config, you, if you enable like uh, config uh, fpu, then the Zephyr know, okay, if I enable uh, uh, fpu, then I need to, you know, give the uh, hyphen d or fp or whatever it is. You know, these are all passing to the comp uh, compiler basically. So, it doesn't stop there, the architecture level code. So, this is one example where the same configuration is pulled into my source code, basically. So what you see here is if defined config RISC-V ISA RV32E instruction is uh, enabled, it does a different kind of code. You can see it's ex uh, it is uh, ex accessing a register differently. If it's not uh, enabled, it, it you know access uh, differently. So all these things are uh, you know naturally it's on the on the ecosystem basically. Okay. So this uh, this slide basically uh, you know I thank uh, Phoenix to uh, you know give us opportunity uh, they provided us a FPGA and RISC uh, Piper Core uh, to basically play around so you know just uh, give a quick uh, introduction so you know it's the most efficient FPGA and you know time to success we want uh, you to get your you know uh, open source uh, RISC Piper ISA easily emulated into a FPGA and you know uh, turn into a kind of a RISC Piper Core and start working on it. And what is so uh, unique is they already have a, a kind of like a manager, so you can easily configure whatever peripherals you need, uh, you know, together with RISC-V, and you just um, uh, generate it. The RTL is generated for you, and the RTL can be loaded into your FPGA and turn into a, you know from FPGA it becomes basically a RISC-V code. Okay, this is uh, some, I think some important point is it's, uh, it's fine, all of us know open source, uh, uh, open source scalable and all this thing, but what uh, uh, Epidix offer in, in side to side is all these things like uh, what I mentioned earlier similarly. So, any question before we jump into the, uh, to the workshop? So, 
if no question we will jump into the workshop session so before we jump into the workshop session i would like to tell what exactly the some uh, high level process going on in this uh, uh, workshop so due to time constraint we have loaded a bitstream on your board we have generated the rpl and we have uh, loaded the bitstream inside it so basically when you turn on your pg it just acts as a general mcu basically pretty clear so what we going to do today is uh, we have a cloud machine for you you have a login id and password and all this thing you can log into that and uh, start doing a hands on build session you know uh, like how we do in software hello world we want to you know do the wiki session and see get your hand around with uh, zapper on you know uh, live session so that's what uh, the today's uh, you know i mean a challenge of all of us because uh, i think inherently when you talk about embedded system and things like that people will tell you to install a lot of tool chains set up all the things even at your home or before you come to the workshop for what we are challenging ourselves and we want you to join together as today do it uh, hands on live on cloud and easily install and see so so we have uh, three prerequisites so basically first thing is you need to download the workshop guide so that you can follow the guide uh, later on so i hope you can see the link uh, it's a short link if you have, uh, if you put the link you will get a pdf disk let me take a picture of uh yeah if you if you guys need some time to type it you can take a picture it's a good idea okay and then the second thing is to check is you need these three items with you i think uh, you should have because we have already pre uh, put on the table uh, pre that then the third thing is you need to have the credential like uh, all of you have uh, credentials and just to ensure your own your own watch for uh, some of the rooms are getting blocked so if you have a hotspot please uh, instead of the wifi Okay, uh, we are pretty good. How long ago? Oh, it's always in history. So it's a hot time. So, uh, so you, I think uh, all of you can turn on your board and all this thing. Just make sure that you have a switch on the board. Actually, there's a small tactile switch. If you turn it on, you will have a lights on you. Just make sure that you have the LED something comes up so that uh, you know your board is powered and your USB is connected. So, so everyone got the credentials basically. So, uh, I guess everyone got the credit. Yeah. Everyone got the. Hello. 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 So, okay. Uh, may I get a raise of hand? Who's using Windows and uh, who's using Windows? 
Okay, there are some hands. Uh, anybody using Linux here to try the hands on? Okay, cool. Open source. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, Mac is uh, unfortunately not. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's mass. Uh, so, you know, for now, no. <laughs> So, okay, the guy covered uh, both, but something to take note is, uh, if you are on Windows, you have to do this uh, thing, what we have provided on Windows Guide, you need to install this Zadik, so that you can uh, install this uh, particular driver actually. So, you just have to follow this guide, uh, you know, you go through all these interfaces, whichever you see, Titanium, uh, TI60, Phoenix. you just have to replace it with this WinUSB driver. And uh, next is, I think, uh, I believe all of you is trying to log into the labs. So I guess uh, all good, right? So good. So uh, you can just launch the dashboard uh, now, uh, you know, so that you get this uh, page. And under the uh, my labs, you can just expand it. You'll see something called machine labs. Okay, and then uh, once you click the machine labs, uh, you'll find something called Arthos Lab for Zypher. Okay, uh, another status check. Uh, may I know how many of you already come to this point where you can see the Arthos Lab for Zypher? Not yet. So let's give uh, some time probably. So you just have to go to my labs and uh, yeah, just say the go to machine labs, stop. And uh, auto slap for that. Okay. So you just go to deploy. Yeah, deploy. So this is so there is an unpicked account here, basically is not being used, you can do not get one. Is that the thing? Or that go to one. So, is that only the point? Is it works? Um, too much is like, I'm just going to see what's it. But if you want to, if you want to use this, just I, I do this one. Uh, I think I heard uh, one of you using Mac. Uh, no worries, if you're using Mac, you can't flash to the board, but at least you get, get the experience how to. Get the binary at least on So, anybody that already got until this step, you can click the point. So that the machine, uh, you know, Linux containers spawn up for you. Pre-configured tool chain, cipher, and everything is in it. So basically, when you deploy, it's on the uh, it's running on a cloud the machine. So a container is spawning up with all the you know all the tool chains and like So once you have put the deploy, basically it's just like turning on your machine, uh, the container just comes up, and after like a minute or so, you know, it takes like the page will reload. Once the page is reloaded, you can find on the right hand side uh, something called code. When you click on load, uh, it will prompt you to something like, uh, do you want to launch? Something like this. And uh, when you click launch code ID, uh, it might even ask you whether you want to enable pop up because you know it wants to open up in another another uh, tab basically. 
and uh, it will ask you password. So where do you pass, uh, find the password is, you go to your dashboard previously, you will find password and the password is on the last field, something called code server password and uh, you see something like a, a password viewer on the right uh, icon, you press that to uh, see the password and it should copy the password also. You can copy the password uh, if it doesn't. So, if the password is copied uh, yeah, and you just click OK, you should get a full blown uh, VS code, like anybody familiar with VS code, uh, it just uh, you know, comes up on your, uh, on your browser. I do see some people already got to the point uh, on their own, uh, uh, they have been able to build the firmware. So I think uh, most of you is at the point where you know VS Code is up, spawn up, uh, you can see like ID uh, is there, it's a good sign. So the next step is you need to, uh, you know any, like any ID you work on, you open up, it's just ID, you want to go to your project folder. So we have set up these FA project folder, uh, you know, it will be something called FPD Zypher. And then you need to put a slash Zypher again, that's where the uh, Zypher, you can see on the top, uh, you know. Just after the username, you add us a slash and then I click cipher slash cipher and I click OK again and the project will be opened up on ID. Uh, to go to the drop down, you go to file on the sidebar. Which drop down you want? No, it's already open. Oh, you open drop. Okay. 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 That means ten minutes. Uh, so you have to so you have to have to so the one Yeah, Oh, the same one more Okay, I think uh, most of you now uh, is on the Phoenix uh, cipher uh, slash cipher, so it should be good. So. Like you know, uh, you need a, basically a terminal to do, you know to interact with Cypher basically, and that's a uh, the, so to do that now you have to go to the same sidebar and go to terminal and click new terminal and you'll get a terminal on the bottom. This is just some IDE guide basically for now. So the the thing is now we need to get the ID just. Comes up for the next step. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so this is your generic uh, Linux uh, kind of bash, uh, uh, you know, bash terminal. Like any of you work with Linux, uh, you know, all the LS, MV, CD, all this command just works out of box. So now, if you go to the uh, uh, basically the uh, guide we have provided, the one on the bolded is a command to do that. But uh, let me just explain what this command is doing. Vest is a helper tool built for Zyper. So whatever you want to interact with a Zyper kernel, you need to use Vest. It's like a front end of the uh, kernel. And uh, hyphen P uh, means it's a pristine, so that you want to clean the build every time you uh, do uh, some build. So that's what I give a dash P, uh, a hyphen P, and always. And dash P stands for board. What board uh, you, you want Zyper to build or you know work with? And uh, the board that currently we are working on is called Titanium Ti sixty F twenty five. And then the project that we want to build. So one of the cool thing about Zyper is also the sample is part of the kernel board. So you know you you got the sample basic blink key there. And uh, all you have to do is click enter. And if you click enter, uh, the, the firmware will be built and you know it will have in a certain folder that I'll tell you later. So I do see some people already got the uh, uh, info like uh, how much RAM it is using and all this uh, information. So that means your know, build is done and your battery is ready. Uh, you know. Uh, let's just get more people before we go to the next uh, step. Mm -hmm. <音>这是一个平台 Yes, 
So the way the poster right now is to Yes, it's actually a Okay. Where is it physically? I don't know why it's on. Oh, it's something similar. It's actually the wrong password. Okay, it's the wrong password. Now into the whole thing. Okay. It's actually the wrong password. You have to add to the string. Yeah, it's okay. Add to the string, you can see the same thing. Okay. Then you can see the same thing. Yeah. Then you can see the same thing. Okay, it's going to be added to the other one. Yes, it's going to be added to the other one. Okay, it's going to be added to the other one. Okay, it's going to be added to the other one. Okay, it's going to be added to the other one. Okay, it's going to be added to the other one. Okay. Mute. Then mute. Then OK. It's a good one. It's a good one. Then I saw young S3. S3 one. Use the change. OK. Then I'll find the other one. Then I'll find the other one. Yeah. Check. Now we're going to use the sound. Now we're going to use the sound. Now we're going to use the sound. So I guess most of you got until the point you got the build done. Like you see some stats, how much RAM it's using and all. So the next step is actually to download the binary. So the binary is inside a bill. If you look for a bill folder or directory, and then you go to a folder called bill slash cipher slash cipher bin. So you download the cipher bin. So that is your bill key or firmware that you are your computer built basically. So and then to download, you just have to go to the file, right click, and click download. Just uh, make sure that you uh, don't save it in a place that you can locate easily later because we have to uh, move these files around a little bit later in your local machine. The reason is uh, your cloud will have access to your board. So we do all the you know, hard work and all the highly complex configuration work on the cloud and we take the binary part, we bring it to your local computer and uh, we flash it to the board. So somebody actually got the blinky up and running. What do you want? You have to right click and download. Okay, so that is basically on your computer, local computer now. It's on your download folder or something. So keep the file uh, for now. So that's where the next step gonna come in. All right. So let me check on a few people. So I, I mean, I like uh, like the jet tank uh, uh, okay. so i believe uh, most of you downloaded the cipher dot bin like uh, how many of you got it like uh, raise up your hand okay uh, we got most of you Okay, cool. So uh, now is, this is the thing we need to. Uh, uh, this is extra step for Linux only. You have to do a git pull currently because we actually just uh, did a live uh, push on uh, a rule. Basically, we missed the rule earlier. So you do a git pull now, you'll get a new file coming into the thing uh, on your cipher directory, the directory you are, the terminal. Just give a git pull. I'm not pull, right? Just as, as a regular user. Then. Yeah, git pull. Once you do git pull, uh, this is only for Linux, uh, okay? Uh, Windows is sorted out because you've done the ZX thingy. Oh, you need because the bin has to be fixed for that. No, uh, so this step is to access uh, on your Linux machine to access your board. So this is like a driver kind of uh, work. Also, from the browser, is going to access the USB port. Okay, not really. So let me just ex uh, explain the step uh, one by one. So uh, we going to download this uh, this thing called Linux.zip in a folder called Flashy, and you need to bring to your local computer. 
to get the correct latest file you need to do git pull because uh, the, the file that in the container is an uh, old file it doesn't have one of the rules uh, if any of any of you know udef adm or udef basically so there is a udef uh, script inside basically so just do a git pull and download the latest linux version for windows you can go ahead and download windows uh, no changes required Yeah, pretty cool. So uh, once you download it, you extract that uh, Linux version. You will find uh, you you can uh, open up on your terminal the current directory and you do a sudo dot uh, slash uh, uh, USB drive dot sh. And what it will do is it will configure all your things to access the board on your local computer. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, basically, you know, we do the build on the cloud, but we want to install to the target uh, FPGA a uh, board uh, using a uh, local machine. So just make sure that uh, you do sudo dot slash USB drive run the script from the folder you extracted it because uh, that's how the paths are configured in the script. So that only will work basically. So you, you are already running the thing. So for those who have already configured uh, on Linux uh, uh, USB driver and all these things, we can go to the next step. So the next step is actually uh, uh, installing the firmware basically. So for Windows, you can just uh, double click the flash, uh, you will see something called flash. It's basically a batch of files or whatever it is to run the script. You just double click if your board is connected and if your blinky file is on the same directory as where you downloaded the zip uh, where you extracted it, it will just uh, load that blinky on your board and your board will start the blinky if it's correct. Or on the other hand, on uh, Linux, you need to open up a terminal and do how you run a script uh, dot slash a flash dot sh. So let's give uh, time for this and let's see how many of you, uh, you know, uh, get uh, blinky out. So I see another bot is blinking also. Uh, when you are, the LED should be, uh, the LED should be up. So. Okay. 
Okay, okay, cool. So I think a uh, couple of you got uh, blinking light. So basically, that means uh, you know you built uh, something using something like a Zypher. You got the binary. You brought your local computer and you were able to flash it. So those that you are, uh, those that already done, you want to go a little bit further up. Uh, just you want to see how shell works. You can actually go to the uh, Blink folder, uh, the same uh, basic uh, Blinky folder. On the project.conf, you can enable something called config underscore shell equal to y. Any of you work with Linux, it's very familiar. And the shell will be up, and uh, technically you can connect to the home port of your laptop and interact with the board. Like uh, I think this is particularly my favorite thing about Cypher is that you know you get a shell out of box. I you know it's pretty nice. Like uh, you get like a shell application on our box basically. Those of you who want to try the shell, you can uh, see uh, my configuration file. So you basically go to samples basic blinky project.com. You just enable config dot underscore shell equal to yes. And uh, you, you do the repeat again, the vegetable command again. You get a new binary and you install on your home port if you have a serial kind of the home port access. Like uh, on Linux, I use a minicom. You could uh, interact with the board uh, using uh, a shell, basically. 
So, the, what you want to know here is this is something very unique about Cypher also. You just enable something here, the build system knows about it, it builds some new source code, some source source code, and it just injects in, inside your thing, and you get a new application. So, this is, I think, a pretty cool drive for something like a microcontroller. Yeah. So I think uh, to wrap up a little bit, uh, to wrap up, uh, we can say that uh, most of you that go to court are able to blink, uh, able to uh, build and you know, have a hands-on session on Zyper. Because uh, I know you can go and learn all this thing, but having a hands-on session is always good, you know, oh, this is how it works, you have, you put your time here, in like one hour time you need a build and blinky, so when you go back home, you know, you can explore more at once things. So, any any question, we can open for question also, like if anybody has any question go regarding Zyper, or are you interested to contribute to the journal or whatever it is, I'm happy to share.
Yeah, uh, Ah, yes. <laughs> So, uh, guys, uh, we have, I hope uh, all of you uh, got some uh, insights, uh, especially uh, in fact with Cypher. And uh, I'm so glad to see, you know, we got a blinky up because this was a challenge also, like, it was the first time we push FPGA, uh, we push Cypher, and we push it live basically, like uh, on cloud and all these things. So I'm happy to see it's blinking. I hope you are happy also. And uh, I wrap up my session here and uh, thank you so much for attending this uh, particular uh, workshop. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thank you very much. Um, please one more time a round of applause for our, our speakers, Manoj Kumar. So thank you one more time. Thank you. So we get to keep the box, right? <laughs> that you have to ask. Eh? If you touch it, you keep it, right? <laughs> the boss is there. <laughs> so boss, can we have it? Boss? <laughs> okay, anyways. So let's get the next. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Is there any questions? Any, anybody? Or you have already asked all the questions you need to ask?